Welcome everyone. Uh, today for this ICDSS lecture, we'll be going over recurrent models and uh, natural language processing. So just as a general overview, we'll start with the basics of uh, a recurrent cell and how that uh, applies to recurrent neural networks. Then we'll touch very quickly on more specific types of recurrent cells like LSTMs and GRU cells. Then we'll see some applications to computer vision, then some applications to natural language processing, and then we'll have a, a quick demo where we'll be trying to generate some Donald Trump tweets uh, on the fly. We'll see if we can do that. Uh, just so you know, there will be a quiz at the end of the lecture. Uh, with the possibility to win some Amazon, Amazon vouchers, so be sure to stick for that. And also, please, if you have any questions at any moment, uh, feel free to just step in, because I, I don't know if I can read the chat easily if I get a notification or anything. So if you see that I'm not answering, just feel free to uh, just uh, step in and uh, I'll be uh, glad to answer. Also, before we start, uh, just know that uh, there is still time to get tickets for AI Hack, so you can just head to 2021.aihack.org and get your tickets here if you want to build a team, compete and uh, try your chance at winning prizes. Cool. So where are we starting from? Uh, most of you, if you came to the previous lectures or if you are already familiar with the uh, sort of machine learning, uh, you'll know that in classical feed-forward neural networks, like the one presented here, the data is fed from one side and then is sequentially fed through each layer until we get an output. And as a general rule of thumb, we saw through experimentation that the deeper the network, the better the performance we get because we're able to learn sort of more minute details and we're able to get better predictions. But this has a problem uh, because it's like, how deep can you get? Because once neural networks get super deep and sometimes it can be hundreds of layers, uh, they get really hard to train. And so there were attempts to kind of circumvent that. For instance, on the right, you have a uh, residual neural network where the, there were those residual blocks that kind of allow the gradients to flow through more easily. Uh, so as to kind of mitigate the issue of having that super deep neural network, which works really great, but this is kind of just yet uh, another hack to to get a better performance. And also the issue is with that is that we're even with adding skip connections, like on the right, we're still adding weights and biases, and some models can end up having millions and millions of weights and biases, which can also become very intractable. So the question is, how can you get the benefits of deep neural networks without all the overhead that comes with it? I'll just do a quick check on the chart before we get. So this is where we introduce the idea of recurrent layers or recurrent, recurrent cells. I'll, mostly be using those interchangeably. So here we have a single uh, recurrent layer A, which has two inputs. So one is from XT, which is our actual data input, and another input here that it feeds from itself. And so this is because the recurrent cell, so A here, maintains what we call a hidden state which we call HT, which is essentially just a vector, which we initially initialized to zero at the beginning, and that we'll keep passing on uh, to it. And so this kind of mimics having a deep, a deeper neural network. So in sort of more mathematical terms, our cell here is really just a function f of w, subject to certain weights w, and that takes in the previous state at t minus one and the input. So you can see that our recurrence relation, the name, comes from the fact that we feed, we get ht from the previous state as well, as well as from the input. 
And so, so this is great. So essentially our cell really, we just feed it some input and we can cycle through it as many times as we want, just like creating new hidden states and updating it as we want. And that function, just so you know, f of w uh, gives us the, the output and it's based on the weights and we use the same weights uh, every step of the computation. So still looking at the same idea, but kind of more concretely. So here we have just an abstract f of w function that takes in two parameters. Here we have a more sort of concrete example of what f of w could be. So here, very simply, our function could just be 10h of the previous hidden state multiplied by some weight matrix w, which we initialize randomly, and we want to learn those weights here as well as those weights here, and our input x that we just concatenate together to get our new output, uh, our new hidden state, sorry, ht. And, um, but be, be aware that this is really just one very simple implementation of our recurrent cell and we'll see uh, two examples uh, more much more complex examples later on so really just for now the thing to understand about recurrent neural networks is that it's really just a function that depends on some input some previous state to update the current state and we can cycle through the through this as many times as we want do we have any questions so far on that Feel free to just step in uh, anytime. Cool. Okay. So here we look at a more sort of concrete example of how we would go about training uh, an RNN. So before we just had one cell, here we actually have the same setup. It's just that the computation graph. So here we've enrolled, you can imagine like a time axis here, and we've enrolled the computation uh, to that axis. But essentially what happens is that this here just gets fed back in to the same cell. And but we see all the updated values on the X axis. So this is a simple example of character prediction. So as input, we have what we call a vocabulary. So we are only considering four letters, H, E, L, and O. So our input is just a vector that represents the character. So the first, we just put a one where uh, we want to encode our, our character. This is just a one hot encoded vector. So this is the representation of H, similar for E and L, and O would just be the last uh, entry here, uh, one and everything else at zero. And our uh, output is a probability distribution also of size four that aims to predict what a uh, character is following the character that we inputted, right? So we input a character as a one hot encoded vector through the cell and the cell outputs a the next character that it thinks uh, will be after the character we inputted. The hidden state here is of size three. And you might you might wonder how do we go? Because here I didn't really speak about an output. Here really we just have the hidden state that we're updating. There's no notion of output. So how can we get an output from our hidden state here? And the way we do that is that once we have our hidden state, we can just sort of plug in any fully connected layer after to reshape our hidden state into the, the desired output. So here we have another weight matrix, WHY, that takes as input the hidden state, which is a three vector, and outputs probability distributions, a four vector. And actually to be true probability distributions, th this example is not great, but we probably want to soft max that, so they all sums to one, but th that's just a detail. And Cool. So we start here by feeding the letter H that predicts E, which we feed again, which predicts L, which we feed again, which predicts L again, etc. And you'll see that the intuition behind this is that 
the hidden layer acts as a summary of all the previous data that, were, that was passed in. So if I were to start, I would initialize my hidden layer at all zero. So you can imagine if we had the initial sort of computation step zero here, which is not represented, that would be all zeros. We pass in H that gets updated. Then we pass in, we sample from the output, we pass in it as an input and we take our previous hidden layer. So the hidden layer kind of passes through all every step and really acts as a summary of everything that has happened before. So, so this adds sort of a notion of memory, if you want to, uh, to the network. Is that clear to, to everyone? Again, feel free to just tap in at uh, any moment. Cool. So this is a simple first example. Uh, we'll see that we can have, if you look around for RNNs, you'll probably see a lot of sort of graphs like that, which can be kind of uh, confusing at first. So the thing to understand is that our RNN is really just a single cell i mean there can be multiple but for now we will just keep it for now we'll assume that we just have the single cell which is the green cell with one input and one output and that doesn't change really but what happens is that it just feeds into the same cell every time what we're really showing here it's that we're unrolling again like in the previous example the computation graph and we're saying okay when are we sampling the output because technically we're always generating an output and the notion here is just when are we sampling the output for something useful? So th this is just a bit abstract. I'll, I'll use an example. Here we have a one to many relationship. So this can be used, for instance, for image captioning, where we input an image and as an output, we want a sequence of text that describes that image. We'll actually have an example on that a bit later on. And so here, the red part is going to be my image that I, that I input. And then I will continuously feed the same input. My input doesn't change because it's just one image, but I will sample at every iteration, every time I update, oops, here the HT, I, I will take all of them and treat them as a new word every time and just sample all that kind of opposite we have, we can have a many to one relationship. So for instance, this can be video classification where every input is a different frame of the video. And we want to determine whether that video contains say a cat or not. So here, say I, my video has three frames. I'll, I'm inputting the first frame and it's not displayed here, but technically an output is produced, right? Same here. An output is produced but we're just ignoring it we're just we're just passing the entire video through the model and we just care about the last output so we are just sampling the very last output once we've passed in the entire video through the network but this is quite important to understand that there is still technically an output every time and then we so then it's just a question of how you want to use your network you can pass the entire input and then sample once the entire input has been passed in, or you can, for every input, get sample and output. For instance, if you want to, there is like an, an example, uh, say you have a video and it's daylight and you, and you want to sort of convert that video to as if it was the same video, but at night, then you, that would be a one to one mapping like many to many, but between the frames, they would be mapped one to one, uh, where here you have a certain frame at day and here you have a certain frame at night, just uh, an example. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Now, so as I said, the example we've seen is a super simple cell. It's just like a, a tan H function. And that actually doesn't work great because 
as we cycle a lot through the cell, we can get issues of gradient vanishing and gradient explosion, which also happens with super deep neural networks. So it's we, we're still kind of carrying the, the same uh, burden along. And so there are more complex, much more complicated cells that try to mitigate the issue. So here on the left, we have our first cell that's just two inputs, tan H output, head and state. And I won't go too much into the detail of how those cells work because it it's it can get quite technical but there's a super article here that i really recommend you read about if you want to get an understanding of how that that works in a much more intuitive manner but essentially we we are kind of trying to ease gradient flow from cell to cell and to avoid gradient vanishing and gradient explosion by using different gates here and there's a similar concept with the GRU cell, which, uh, if I recall correctly, correctly, stands for gated rectified unit. Not sure on that one, recurrent unit. And uh, yeah, so it can kind of like people trying out different cell architectures, and you can even create your own cell architecture if you want. Really, the at the end of the day, the thing that characterizes a recurrent cell is really that hidden state that get that gets passed along and that acts as a summary of everything that has been seen so far. Um, William, yeah, someone's go ahead. got a question to ask. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had a question about, do you know when you talked about the R and, um, and, and sampling where you have like the different graphs yep. like many to one and whatnot? Yep. Um, I had a question about the many to one. Mm -hmm. um, so do you know you have like you, for example, the I think the example you used was the video frames. What? Yeah. How could you get an output for that? Like, what would be an example for the output? Uh, the output could just be a binary. Uh, so okay, here you input video frames. Here you have your hidden state that can be like a one hundred and twenty eight vector, and your output could just be zero or one to to say is there a cat or not so here you would have a fully connected layer that sort of takes in the 128 long uh, hidden state and given that will tell you if there is a cat or not that, that's a very simple example but you could have much more classes like is there a cat is there a dog is there a human like just a classification problem if that makes sense yeah thank you thank you for clearing that up Thank you. Yeah, no worries. But but the thing to understand is that so you, you your video has three frames here, you pass that in, and th there would be an output generated here. Say in the first frame there is no cat, here there would be it would be predicting zero, so like no cat. Maybe same for here, and maybe the cat only appears at the last frame and only appears here. So or maybe the cat only appears in the second frame. But so we, we discard all that and we really just look at the accumulated hidden state that has seen all the frames and that acts as a summary of all the frames we've seen before and then we just sample at the end to kind of say like okay was there a cat or not in this entire video given everything you've seen cool so yeah so well here we have a perfect example of uh classing uh, classifying videos with RNNs. So here we have all the frames of of our video that we pass in first through a CNN. And we are oh, I should just use the next slide real quick. So here's an example of a of a CNN. And you can imagine that if this was a classification problem, say if we had 10 classes at the end, we would have a fully connected layer with 10 outputs because we would be classifying out of 10 uh, classes. What we can do is pre-train that model, that full model with the output layer here, pre-train it, then cut off the output and just keep the intermediate layer here, which has 4096 neurons, and treat this as kind of a summary of the image. So we input the image, it gets treated through our confer net, and then at the end, we get a vector that summarizes that image. Because 
it would be impossible to directly connect a convolutional layer to a RNN, so you have to, to pass in a, a vector in our case. Although technically you could, but it would be a bit wacky if you know we're staying in the in common grounds. So yeah, so you would get that vector that summarizes the image and that you can feed into uh, your RNN. And so that's what that's what happens here. Every frame goes in, gets summed up into a vector, and then goes through a uh, two-stage LSTM. So this is just the same. It's just that we're passing in the output from one STM to the other. And then we recur for every frame on that. And in that case, they sample the prediction at every frame. So maybe they want to know what happens at every frame. But if you want to be, if you want to ask the question, is there a human in this entire video, you could discard all those outputs and just look at the last one. But this is really just down to the uh, application and uh, what you actually would do with it. But so you can see here that RNNs can be used for treating language, but also for images. As long as at the end of the day you're passing in a vector, you can just update your LSTM recursor and get some meaningful output. So on that example here, so that was video classification, so getting a class uh, at the end. Here we have an, an example of image captioning where we, given an image, we want to be able to get a meaningful sentence describing that image. So for example, here we could have a um, person wearing a straw hat. So just giving that image, we want that description. How, we, how, would, how we would do that? Again, we give in the image here, we just have one single image that gets summed up as a vector. And here is a bit more technical because RSL, instead of having two inputs, remember how before we had as input X, so that here, and H, so the previous hidden state, here we have three inputs. So we have the hidden state as usual to recur through. Our input is now the text sequence that we are generating. So this is just a start token. That just means, okay, start the, the sequence. So, and then we have a, our, sorry, then we have our picture summary here that we're also inputting into the calculation. And the way we do that here is just concatenation, but again, you could design your cell how, however you want it, and you could combine them however, however you want it. So here, how that would work is that we first input a start token that just kind of tell, it's just a trick to tell the RNN to, to start because you don't want to be inventing the first word, so it's just start. Here we can imagine that the output is true. That output would get refed in with still the same summary vector here that doesn't change and that still gets fed in at every step. So here we would be predicting straw. We, we feed straw in here, we predict hats, we feed that again and on and on and on and on until at the end we produce a end of sequence token, which is similar to start token, but just for the end. Is that clear to, uh, to everyone? It's a bit of a more complicated example. Okay, no hands raised. Again, I can't really see raised hands unless I explicitly uh, take a look at the Teams meeting, so just interject and that'll be good. Cool, so so that's pretty cool. Like, you, you can imagine that we go from an image to text, which are two data types that seem completely unrelated and very distant from each other, but we can still kind of go from one to the other. And there are even models that go the other way and that take text in and generate an image, which is pretty cool as well. And they do the same thing. Essentially, what you do is you feed in your sentence that updates the hidden state, and then the hidden state is acts kind of a summary of that sentence, and that gets fed into a network that eventually turns it into uh, an image. 
which is pretty cool. And also the really interesting, interesting thing to insist on here is the fact that we have three inputs here and that that summary vector, although it's constant, it gets fed in at each step as well. So the cell has a notion of what it's working with. Cool. So now we'll look more at the natural language processing side of things and we'll look at word embeddings. So if you recall that example here, we're using le single letters and we have what we call a vocabulary of four because we just have four letters. But in a real world setting, you would more you would want to use words because for a model it's easier to work with uh, bigger pieces like words and piece them together rather than letters where with letters you have to remember that like, it's much more complex to handle on a per letter basis because you have to remember every single rule about grammar whereas with words it's kind of much more piecing them together in big blocks, which can be easier for training. But on the other side, the vocab uh, for words can be absolutely massive, like in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And also we have that issue where if we want to encode words, we would have a 10,000 long vector with just one uh, entry at one for every word. And so we could have some words that are in vector space very close but that are completely unrelated to each other and so that's an issue as well it doesn't convey any meaning and um, so the issue here and the problem we want to solve if we solve is how can we associate words to much smaller vectors so maybe a 300 long vector and also hopefully get some meaning out of those vectors where if two vectors have more or like kind of close in distance, Euclidean distance, they, they're kind of mean the same thing. And so that's the problem that uh, models like word to vec try to solve. So word to vec is a model that where you feed in, you, you give it a word like cat, and it will give you a 300 big vector that represents that word. The way we do that is that we have a huge data set of text. And for every word, we so say, say in our data set, we have 10,000 words here. So this is our input. And for every word in our massive text data set of Wikipedia articles, journals, whatever, we pick words. And for every word, we try to predict the words that are around it. So say I have the, the sentence, I pet my cat, and I pick the word cat. So I will be feeding that in as a one hot encoded vector. Here, I have much less neurons than in the input. So the model will have to somewhat summarize in a lot less space what cat means with many less features and at the end what we do is that we pick a random word in the in the vicinity like in the neighbors of cats so here we can pick we can pick pet for instance and we want to predict that okay and so that might seem a bit weird as well uh, like at first but the intuition behind that is that similar words appear in similar contexts. For instance, it's very common to see I pet my cat and I pet my dog, right? So if I input cat and if I input dog, I will have about the same output. I will have about the same distribution of words around those words because they tend to appear in the same context. And so if they have close outputs, then in order to perform well at this learning task, they will have close representations, right? So their vectors will be very close in order to produce similar outputs because they're often seen in the same word context. 
And so it, this is a bit difficult to grasp at first, but it's really just, it, it all stems from the fact that similar words appear in similar contexts. And so at the end, this gives us a 300 dimensional space where words close semantically with similar meanings are also closer together in that space, hopefully. And so that's super cool because then we, we've gone from a super messy, uh, like sort of data, data type of words and text where everything changes and, uh, and is really not friendly to work with to just math, like simple 300 big vectors that we can just manipulate around. And since those vectors, unlike the one hot encoded vectors that were that didn't have any semantic meaning, those smaller word embedding vectors actually carry some semantic meaning around. So we can do math with them. And really the typical example with that is that if you have the vector for king and that you subtract from it the vector for man and that you add the vector for woman, you get the vector queen, right? So because the semantics are now encoded in those vectors. Similarly, if you take the vector for London, you subtract the vector for England and you add the vector for Japan, you would get Tokyo, which is quite mind blowing to have. Do we have any questions on that? Because at first, it can be a bit difficult to to grasp at first sight. Okay, so far so good. Okay. Now, so word to vec is a pre-trained model. So that was trained with some huge data set by some person somewhere. But PyTorch also allows you to use your own word embeddings. Uh, where instead of relying on pre-trained models, we would we just use the NN dot embedding layer. So that just sits as an actual layer and just acts as a lookup table where you give in a word and it outputs uh, an embedding vector. And the fancy thing is that the embedding mappings, so the vectors here, initially just get initialized randomly and the event embeddings get learned as you train your model. So that's quite neat. So just the only thing to remember is that you have two ways of using embeddings. You can e e either use pre-trained models or you can kind of train your embeddings as you go by putting them as a layer. Right, now we have just a simple example of uh, natural language processing, a typical problem in that field is a sentiment analysis, and that is the problem of looking at a piece of text and determining whether that text is, say, positive or negative. And the way we we go about that in simple, uh, in simple term, in a simple straightforward way, is just we have our vocabulary here. So if you notice, every word is mapped to a number, and so that number initially without embeddings would just be a one hot encoded vector, but we embed that. So that gives us a small semantic vector that we then feed into the LSTM. So remember LSTM is just that cell here, but that, that just acts exactly the same uh, in principle as an RNN cell. And we just iterate through that, we pass the entire text and then at the end, we take the hidden state of the LSTM, which we pass through the fully connected layer here, and then we get our probability uh, score here. So that would help us to classify whether that comment is positive or negative. Any questions before we kick into the demo? Yeah, sorry, what's a sigmoid? Okay. Sigmoid is just an activation function that squashes uh, anything between zero and one. So this it's used very often in neural networks because say your layer here would 
can output anything, so it can output like five, but you want a probability score, so it has to be zero, uh, like between zero and one, right? Right, so, so it's like normalization. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Now it just kind of squashes it between zero and one. Anything else? Uh, I had a question. Why do you Go bother um, doing the sigma thing, sigma function on the other, like these other outputs? Because it's not here. It doesn't look like it's connected. Yeah, uh, yeah. What's yeah. the point of that? I mean, it, it's because it gets computed every time, but you, here we just ignore it because again, it, here we want to pass the entire text here to update the internal state of our cell and then we are only interested in the output at the end because say here I, I start analyzing that sentence i pass in this that will produce an output but that output is quite meaningless right like uh, i'm betting that the word awesome will probably trigger a much more uh a much higher likelihood for the positive outcome classification, right? So what I'm doing is that I'm feeding every word one by one to update the internal state, ignoring everything here, and then I just sample the output at the end to uh, to get my actual classification, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Anyone else? Cool. OK, so we'll have a, uh, a very uh, quick demo. We'll, so if you want to go onto the, I think I, I dropped the link earlier on, or if Lionel, you can drop it again. So if you go onto the ICDSS GitHub under notebooks in the workshop five here, you'll have the notebook for, for this session. I recommend you download it and run it locally if you know how to do that, because you won't be able to train it uh, online because that will crash <laughs> the notebook. Because if you can't download it, you can just launch Binder here and you have access to it. But Binder is uh, very, it, it, it's great, but it's not made for training <laughs> neural networks online. So if you try to train it, then there it will crash. So do it locally if you can, otherwise, never mind, just use Binder. What we'll be doing is a uh, Donald Trump tweet generator. So I've got a, a data set uh, that has over 5,000 tweets from uh, Donald Trump. You've got the original Kaggle link here. And we'll use that as training data to make a model that kind of learns the essence of how Donald Trump tweets, which is very peculiar, and try to maybe generate some more on the fly. The way we do that is we first start by creating, can, can you see all right, is that big enough? I think it should be okay. Just let me know if anything's wrong. So, with anything in PyTorch, this is not specific to RNNs. When you want to create a data set, you inherit from uh, the data set class that's provided by PyTorch, and that forces you to override two methods, namely the len method that is responsible for returning the number of items in that data set, and then the get item method that given an index has to return the training sample at that index. So we initialize our data set here with a path to uh, the data where I actually I should probably show the date first. Oh, I'm not sharing the right application. Okay, well, whatever. Well, uh, our our file is just a CSV, so comma separated values file that just contains a list of all the 
tweets of Donald Trump. So here we specify the path to FRO, and here we specify the sequence length. The sequence length is very important because we are not training. So as I said, we're going to do character based prediction, but we're not training on the entire tweets. Instead, what we're doing is that we're taking the tweets and cutting them in fixed length uh, sequences. The reason we do that is that you want. You don't want to train on a. Kind of unfixed length of data. What we're doing here is that we're taking in our case, we'll use 32 as the sequence length. So we're just taking 32 characters, feeding that again and again and again, getting our predictions, and then we back propagate through all that. Then we get the next sequence, feed that all in, get an error, back propagate on that error. So we're back propagating on a per sequence basis, and this defines the length of our sequence, which in our case uh, will be defined as a 32. So we read our data from the CSV file. So this just gives us a pandas data frame with all, uh, all the tweets in them. Then we have to define the our vocabulary. So our vocabulary is all the characters that we will be working with. So for this, I just have a very quick get unique chars function that looks at all the tweets and lists all the unique characters that it sees in in the entire data set. This is just done by uh, iterating through uh, every character in the data set and adding it to a set. So chars is a set of all the unique characters we have. And so our vocabulary will just be that. So we'll be training on all that. And then so just to show you. Because this so we have 100 if we look at all those tweets, we have 121 characters and those are all the vo the vocab that we'll be using you can see that there are some weird ones but i don't know what trump tweets weird things anyway so we, we have all that that we'll be trained on in a realistic setting though you would probably want to strip away all the really weird characters because that will just help reduce the dimensionality of the prediction and will generally make training faster, easier, and more accurate. Then, importantly, we define two variables here, int to char and char to int, and those are very simply two dictionaries that map a given character from the vocabulary to an integer and vice versa. So very simply what that does is it takes all the characters here and says this is character zero, this is character one, this is character two, this is character three, etc. And the way we do that, I mean the reason we do that is that it's a first step towards going from characters to vectors. So every character is mapped to a unique integer which will then map to a one hot encoded vector. So this is we basically just utility. And then here we generate our sequences, which is a list of pairs of an input sequence with a target sequence. So let's look at how we do that. The thing to understand is that when training, sequence the input and the target sequence have to be shifted by one. So say my entire for simplicity my entire sentence is hello my input is going to be hell and my output is going to be hello like that because if you recall um, that slide here oops here here you can see that it's shifted the input like the first character gives you the second the second gives you the, the third, etc. So it will all be shifted by one. So this is why here I just iterate through all the tweets and I create, I get sequence length plus one characters, which I then make an input sequence and an output sequence out of, right? 
And then when I will feed that, that to the RNN, essentially there will be a one-to-one -one correspondence here where H has to predict E, E has to predict L, L has to predict L, L has to predict O, if that makes sense to, to everyone. We good? Okay. Yeah, so I've got all my sequences here. And so that's good. Now all I have, so just in the length, we return the number of sequences we have because that's what our data set is comprised of. And then in our overloaded get item method, so we're asked to return the sequence with index IDX. And the way I do that is, so the input is going to be the first element of my sequences I index index. So because remember those are pairs input target and the target is going to be uh, element one. Just so you know, this is not a typo. It's just because input like that is a reserved keyword. Then I encode that sequence. So that means, so at this stage input is just going to be a string. Then I encode it. So that means that I turn every character in that string into a number using the char to int um, dictionary here. So this is just really, I just iterate through every letter and change it into its character, uh, integer, sorry, uh, equivalent. And then I one hot encode that sequence. And the way I do that is I create a vector with all zeros and I just put a one where the integer value of that character is. OK, so all this essentially those three lines, I go from. A string, so a list of characters to a list of one hot encoded vectors representing those characters. And then for the targets, similarly, I go. From strings so or a list of characters to just a list of numbers, because this is a bit of a PyTorch quirk PyTorch in classification problems as output doesn't expect the one hot encoded vector, but just expects the class number. So here we just keep the class numbers as they are. We transform them to PyTorch tenses and then we return that. So that will give us the this item. And so I can try that if I run that and then I instantiate. So I can do data equals tweet. Uh, tweet data set the path. I have my data here and my sequence length is going to be 32. So that initializes correctly. So this is all the vocabulary we have. And then I can just so you know that that's a neat trick. So here I want to call my get item function like that. So uh, zero. So this is what it returns. It returns here the sequence as a, a tensor of 100 content vectors and here the corresponding uh, classes. But there's that actually is there's a shortcut if when you use the bracket notation here, it just treats it as if you were calling this get item method. Similarly for len, just so you know, len of this, so this prints all the sequences we have, this is equal to this. It's just shortcuts. Cool. Is that clear so far for everyone for the date set before we go into the model? I had a question about yeah not this in particular but more of a general question mm -hmm. um so do you know how you i'm a, i'm not sure are you like overriding the methods in the class yeah okay so then yeah. and then you use and then like when you train it it uses these methods that you've set yourself right exactly okay 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 thank you no worries good point cool okay so let's get to the model. Our model is a 
is going to be uh, super simple. It's actually just the same as that one. So we have our input, I mean, except for the dimension. So we have our input, one grew cell, and then our output. So the way we initialize that is, again, PyTorch stuff. When you create a model, you have to inherit from nn.module. What we specify is the input size. So that's the size of the red cell here. Then the hidden size. So that's the size of the hidden state of our cell. The output size, so the size of the blue cell here and then the number of, of layers we have but we won't care about that that's just if we want multiple recurrent layers we'll just settle for the simple example of one for now here we just do some variable signing and we really just have two layers we have our groove cell that we initialize here and our fully connected layer which we stick on top of the groove cell and you'll notice that our group cell takes in as input uh, the, the words, but the hidden size is not the size of the output. So the way we get an output from our group cell is by stacking on a fully connected layer with input hidden size and output output size. And so that will give us our wanted output. Then in the forward step, we, we are given the input X and the previous, so that's where our recurrence relation steps in, our previous hidden state, which we pass into our grid cell and we get the output and the updated hidden state. Then we, uh, we just do some reshaping here and then we just pass in our output through our fully connected layer and we get our outputs here and also we have a helper method in the hidden that gives us the first because once we've started cycling through the cell we we have our hidden layer that our hidden state sorry that we uh, kind of feed back in every time but initially we just use that to get a vector of or a tensor because it's batched but kind of ideally a vector of zeros uh, to, to start with Th does that make sense it's just simple vanilla sort of grew network cool so then we can train that also, I, I recommend you you look at the the comments and the descriptions because uh, I kind of insist on all the the shapes and everything, and I find that thinking about shapes in PyTorch is uh, is useful in uh, in getting some intuition. So feel free to also go through this again uh, in in your free time. And as I was saying before, if you then want to augment this with word embeddings, uh, that's awesome. Definitely go for it. So that's our model. Now we can start training it. So here I just define a couple of hyperparameters. So we'll be training with a batch size of 32, 10 epochs. This is just the print interval, learning rate of 0 0.001, sequence length, as I mentioned before, of 32. And layers, we just have one cell, and our hidden size will be 128. And note that th this could be anything, because again, we just have that fully collected layer that takes in the hidden state and morphs it into our desired output. So our hidden state can be of any size. Those are kind of just default parameters for us, small RNN. Then we have our training loop here that takes in our model, our optimal. If you're familiar with PyTorch, that will, that will be OK. We just have a model, our optimizer, our loss function, the data, the device we're training on. We iterate through every epoch, and for so an epoch is just a run through the entire data set. And so for every epoch, we iterate through our data set here in batches 
of 32, as we've defined here. And for every batch, we get the input, the target, X and Y. We send those to the device, so that depends on whether we're trained on the CPU or the GPU. Here we are, we are at the beginning of a batch, so we initialize our hidden state, which will be all zeros. We also send that to the GPU. We reset our optimizer, so this is just classic PyTorch. And then here, we pass in our entire batch, compute our error, and then backpropagate that. And loss average is just used for logging here. Right, so really the only thing that differs here with the vanilla uh, network is the fact that we have the hidden state here. And then, so that's our training function. Then here in practice, we, so that, that will touch back on the last question. So here I instantiate my data set and here I use a PyTorch data loader to which I feed in my data set. And what the data set does, or the data loader, sorry, the data loader takes in the data set and uses those two overloaded methods, len and get item, to batch your, uh, your data. Okay, so we also pass in the batch size because our get item method only returns one item. So the role of the data loader is you give it a data set and it will take care of batching up everything in uh, with random sampling, which increases the, the training rate. And drop last is just, uh, we just specify that we only want full batches of 32 items because if you have drop last equals false, if your data set size isn't integer divisible by the batch size. So if you have say like five extra samples, then you might get a batch of five, which can mess around with the model. So here we just want full batches of batch size. Here we just get the device to train on. Here it's a bit more interesting. We start creating our model. Our input size is going to be our vocab size, so it's going to be 121 here, because this is the the number of inputs that we can have as a one hot encoded vector. So our first argument here is the input size, which is going to just going to be input size. Hidden size can be anything. We've defined it as 128. Our output size is going to be our input size as well. Why so? This is because we're feeding in the output to the input again, so they must match in size. Okay. And then and layers is just the recurrent layers. We send our model to the device. We use just two standard, we use a standard optimizer, Adam, standard loss function cross entropy for a classification problem because we're in classification, we're classifying characters. We pass all that to our training loop and then we save our model. So I, I won't I won't run that because that will fry my laptop. I, I ran just 10 epochs early on. But that will work. Uh, if Lino is correct, you should be able to run it on the Google Colab. And uh, yeah, any questions so far on the training? Cool. Okay, and now the fun part. So we've trained our model. Now we'll generate some tweets. So the way we do that is to so have that generate function here. My function takes in the model, the data set, start, which is the start sequence, and the length, which is the number of characters we want to generate. Start. It's just going to be like essentially what we're doing is we want our model to complete our sentence as if a, our model was Donald Trump. So I can write hello and tell my model, okay, complete me. 
so the way I do that is that again start I encode as a one hot I encode every character as a one hot encoded vector so this is just to put it in the shape that the model expects the data to be in I initialize my hidden layer to all zeros then here I pass in every character of my start input sequentially and notice here that I'm keeping my hidden state but I'm discarding the output right so this is kind of equivalent to what we have uh, here like I, I'm feeding in all the input and discarding the output I don't care I just want to update the hidden state right I want my hidden state to be a summary of my start sequence so now I keep that very carefully and then I just iterate length number of times and here I just get an output which is going to be a probability um, I, I turn into a probability a probability distribution using softmax and then here all this is just to kind of sample that probability distribution you could arg max it so take the uh, the character that had the highest probability but in practice it's better to sample it uh, as a probability distribution because that kind of gives you more variance so top is the character that was predicted and then i from that character prediction i do I return it into a one hot encoded vector that I re input into my model? So now I'm just kind of iterating through my model and then for the length of the sequence, and then I return that, and that generates tweets like that. And so you'll see that I just have 10 epochs, which is really lame. Ideally, you'd want to train it for much, much longer and have much, much, much more data. But even with just that, you can see that. We, we have definitely some words, we have some structure, we have some sentences, and sometimes, I don't know if we can have that, so we have Republicans, sometimes we can, we even have some Twitter links. I don't know if we'll get lucky here. Ah, well, we just had one, I passed it. Well, but that's pretty cool. Like sometimes you can, yeah, here, see, we have like a Twitter link and that's all generated on a per character basis, right? We have some at mentions, we had we have at New York Times. And yeah, that, that sounds more or less like Trump, <laughs> who just after 10 epochs, which is pretty cool to have for such a small model, such a small data set. Cool. Do you have any questions? Uh, I had a question regarding. Um, okay, so if you if you wanted to like change the length of the, um, like you want to use words instead, um, yeah. and I I'm not sure where would you like change that because I was looking in the like on the during the training they said like you have like sequence length and it says thirty two, would yep. like, how would you get that to be variable? So if I understand correctly, the question is how would you go about doing word sequencing instead of character sequencing? Yeah, basically. Right. OK. So the way you would do that, first off, you'd have to change the data set here to encode words and not characters. So here I have get unique chars. Here you'd have to do get unique words to work on a per word basis. OK. And then you would be returning sequences of words. And then in the model, you'd have to add an embedding layer before the GRU layer so, so that you turn your words into a smaller word embedding vector that you, you then feed into the GRU cell. And then I guess also after the fully connected layer, you'd have to do a kind of a reverse lookup and go from vector to course to closest words associated to it, if that makes sense. But there, there, there are quite a few things to change it. It's not super trivial, but it's definitely a fun thing to uh, to look at. You you should look at uh, 
uh, oops, where is it? Uh, the documentation here with the torch dot and then the embedding layer. Look at that, and then try to kind of work your way, work you work your way with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else so far? Yeah. I can hear you, but only very faintly. I don't know if you're far away from, from your mic, maybe. Sorry, I'll try to speak louder. Is that better? Okay, that's a bit better. Yeah, thanks for the demo. Uh, I think you mentioned it that about the neural network design can have a dense layer. So the, the question was kind of explain why we have a dense layer in our neural network. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Cool. Good question. So the thing to understand is that our recurrent cell, our GRU cell here, all it's doing is updating its internal state or like hidden state, which is of size, hidden size. But this is of size 128, right? I've set it here, hidden size 128. It could be anything. This is just the hidden state of the cell and it's what gets updated uh, uh, every uh, iteration. Now, what we want to predict is the probability distribution over 121 uh, letters because that's the size of our vocabulary. We want a probability for every one of those characters, right? So our output is 121 and somehow we have to go from our hidden size, which is 128, to our output size, which, which is 121. And the way we do that is just by stacking a dense layer uh, that goes that from goes 128 from one to one, one. and, uh, and uh, that gives us that our gives output. Us Does that make sense? Uh, okay, yeah, that's clear. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I think we'll start. We have a a quiz time now with uh, some Amazon vouchers to win. If you so, could we get that uh, going on, Casper? I, uh, I was muted. Cool. Yeah, just share my screen and then. Yep. Well, I'll stop sharing mine. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yep. So, can you feed the convolutional layer directly to an RNN cell? So. Okay, so what you do in general when you have a convolutional layer that you want to then feed into an RNN is that you have to, because a convolutional layer is in most cases two-dimensional, but your RNN will take a one-dimensional uh, vector, so you want to flatten that out and essentially turned out into turned out into a, a, a vector. Okay, next one. Cool. Actually, quite a lot of good answers here. Yeah. So if you, it's a shame I can't show the slides, but if you recall the example with the image captioning, we fed as input the summary of the image. So yeah, essentially you can design your own cells to take 
as many inputs as you want. So that, that's pretty cool. Similarly for outputs. Yeah, so similarly, so once you have your hidden state, you can feed that to as many outputs as you want. And so just off the top of my head, for example, some recurrent neural networks use attention mechanisms where you output, say, a classification score for an image. But at the same time, from the same hidden state, you also output uh, a probability distribution of where to look next in the image so that you can kind of focus the next iteration on the image and then that gets fed back in. So yeah, you can have as many inputs and as many outputs as you want. Yeah, so in sentiment analysis, mo in most cases, what you want to do is for an entire text, you want one classification. So if you do many to one, you pass in the entire text and then at the end, you get your results. If you technically, you could do many to many, but that would be more sort of classifying individual words because for every individual word you would be getting sampling the output or and the classification uh, up until then so usually in sentiment analysis you, you'd be doing many to one cool oh no that's not the end <laughs> it's like two more <laughs> Yeah, so generally, as I just showed in the Donald Trump example, when you do character based prediction, there's kind of a lot of noise that gets mixed in because the model, in addition to memorizing everything it has to do with word based sequencing, it also has to memorize how to place the individual characters, which is much more finer grained and, and it's a much more difficult task. Whereas if you already abstract away the concept of characters by using concepts of words, it's much easier to train on. Yeah. So yeah, that, that just depends. In our case, we had the same input and output sizes because we were feeding the output into the input. So they have to be the same sizes, but this is not uh, necessarily a given thing. You can have differ, different sizes depending on uh, what you're doing. Cool. And I think that should be the last question. Yep, that's, that's all. So cool. uh, we need winning. five winners. Can you have the entire? Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah, shit, how do I do that? Uh, <laughs> full report, view report. Okay. Um, players, I think nice. it goes in the players, right? Then you get the rankings, yeah. Cool. Awesome. If you get, <laughs> who called themselves William? <laughs> if you guys want <laughs> the, 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 the top five on the, Give us like, like, no, do we need emails? Yeah, yeah. Could you guys yeah. just put your emails in the chat? Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah there we'll send you a uh, some Amazon vouchers soon enough. Okay, can I take back control of the? Uh, yeah, go for it. Uh, I stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Go on, wait. Microsoft Teams is hard. Cool. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, I've linked to some super useful sources here that uh, I've used a bit throughout uh, the lecture. So definitely go uh, check that out, especially those uh, two uh, YouTube videos. One is on RNNs in general, and the other one is on word embeddings, and it really helps to kind of go further in that in that aspect. Also, just a reminder for AI hack, still time to sign up. Go ahead for it. And then last but not least, uh, this is kind of a part in partnership with the, the uh, Computational Biology Society. Uh, they will be having a big AI drug discovery conference on the 27th of February with some big, big players in the field. Uh, some of it will probably uh, using sort of what we've seen today with RNNs. So definitely go sign up for that. Uh, and yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, I'll be hanging in here. And otherwise, thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>